Gotta take my mask off. Today we're talking about anal fissures. He's mad mad for a reason. Anal fissures. This is one diagnosis that not necessarily gets confused with a hemorrhoid, but a lot of times people just come in the office and say, hey, my butt hurts, or hey, I've got rectal bleeding. And we have to decide which one is which, whether it's a hemorrhoid, whether it's a fissure. And there are some small differences between the two that help us to determine which treatment is for which disease. First things first, what is a fissure? An anal fissure is a small tear in the anal mucosa caused by defecation. It is also caused by a tight anal sphincter. A tight anal sphincter is the underlying reason why people have pain with defecation from an anal fissure. This tear that occurs is because in order to have a bowel movement, you take a small hole that looks like this, and it has to get like this before it can have a bowel movement. The only way that it can do that is to make a tear. So what you end up with is this, and you have a bowel movement. The tear that occurs right here is the actual fissure. It occurs in the muscle as well as on the surface of the anus. So that's why a lot of times people complain of pain. Not so much just because of the tear, but also the tear is below the dentate line. The dentate line is the difference between portal versus systemic drainage, which is also the difference between portal and systemic nerves. Portal nerves only feel pressure. They don't feel tearing. They feel necrosis or chemical irritation versus the systemic, if you scratch it, it hurts. A lot of times people describe this as a razor blade coming out of their butt with arterial bleeding. But the biggest thing is you gotta go from this to this and the only way for that to occur is to get a tear and that's how it works. As far as the first thing that comes in to the office, the first symptom that we talk about is rectal bleeding or anal bleeding. When a patient tells me they have rectal bleeding, the first question I ask is, is it bright red or is it purple? If it's bright red, I assume they have a fissure because that's an arterial bleed because it's a muscle that's torn and it's a superficial layer of skin that's torn. So bright red blood, dripping in the toilet, feels like a razor blade is coming out of their butt. Versus hemorrhoids, whether it's internal or external, usually they describe purple bleeding because it's a venous problem. They describe pressure, not pain. The other thing is that the anal fissure pain goes away after a couple of days versus the hemorrhoid can stay there for up to seven to 10 days. And it's really more of a pressure. So there's an acute tear, hurts, and then there's a subsiding of the discomfort versus a hemorrhoid kind of has this big crescendo, big day crescendo. Sorry, I was a band geek. And it gets better over seven to 10 days. The rest of the symptoms, anal pain, razor blade coming out of your butt. There's this great picture. I'll see if I can find it of a toilet with razor blades on it. Uh, pruritus, again, same thing with hemorrhoids versus uh, anal fissure. But this one is itching because of the healing of the tear. These patients don't have fecal incontinence. If they, someone tells you that they have fecal incontinence, you have to start thinking of hemorrhoids or rectal prolapse. They have continence because of that tear that allows them to have to dilate that muscle in order to have a bowel movement. The sensation of pain at rest for a fissure is because you have a tear in your butthole and that butthole tear Feels like a razor blade coming out. As far as the anatomy goes, again, rectum above the dentate line, anus below the dentate line. Uh, you see the papilla here. The tear occurs right here. This is a slice, but remember these muscles are circumferential. So what you're getting is a tear underneath in the muscle or a rip in the muscle and a tear in 
the skin and because it's below the dentate line, it causes pain. Now, as far as diagnosing a fissure or the difference between a fissure and a hemorrhoid, the treatment options that are determined by the diagnosis. There are no tests. This is a clinical diagnosis. This is a physical exam diagnosis. Again, we're trying to determine the difference between a hemorrhoid and an anal fissure. With regards to the diagnosis and treatment, hemorrhoid versus fissure, there's subtle differences. Again, you still got to do a digital rectal exam. You're looking for a sentinel pile. A sentinel pile is basically a skin tag. It's a skin tag that occurs on usually the posterior aspect of the, of the anus where the fissure is occurring over and over and over and over again. And your body is just trying to heal that by putting extra skin. And the problem is it's a muscle issue, not so much just a skin issue. Every once in a while, if you don't see the sentinel pile or the tear, you'll have to do a, an anoscopy or an examination under anesthesia in the operating room. Once you get the diagnosis, same stuff applies with hemorrhoids. Dietary lifestyle changes, increasing fiber, being careful not to use too much fiber, while at the same time making your stools soft. The biggest thing that you have to do is use colace, mineral oil, whatever you need to, to make your stool like toothpaste. Once you do that, sits baths will help relax that muscle. Again, topical steroids, no, no for both of them. Ice cream actually works better for this than topical steroids. It actually works better for hemorrhoids as well. Um, vanilla, not chunky monkey or anything like that. Nitroglycerin can help relax that muscle. The biggest treatment for anal fissure is nifedipine 2% cream. The hard part about nifedipine 2% cream is most people don't have a pharmacy where they can just go pick it up. They don't make it at CVS. They don't make it at Walgreens. It's usually compounded in a compounding pharmacy. That's somebody that can mix creams and stuff. Most areas have one compounding pharmacy around, so you'll have to track them down. Now, Fetipine 2% is basically a blood pressure pill that they mix in with a cream. It works great because it relaxes the smooth muscles. Relaxing those smooth muscles allows that muscle to relax and stay that way and hopefully heal correctly. The biggest problem with a fissure is as soon as you have a hard bowel movement and you tear, the tear is jagged and the muscle just heals right back. So you're back to square one each time you have a tear. The bad part about not fed 2% cream is that it is a blood pressure medicine. If you put a little bit and you get a lot above the dentate line, it can be absorbed so you can drop your blood pressure. So you have to watch and make sure that you're giving this to someone that doesn't have a low blood pressure. Because it actually dilates up smooth muscles and it can actually get absorbed, you can also have headaches from this. Traditionally with the treatment, we treat it for about three to four weeks. After three to four weeks, probably 60% of patients, when they combine this with a stool softener, will not have any more symptoms. The rectal bleeding will be gone, the pain will be gone, and it's pretty good long-term. They may have an occurrence every once in a while, so we give them a refill. 60% of those patients don't go on to have surgery. If you require surgery, that's a different issue. Old school treatment, dilation. We actually don't do this anymore. What we used to do is go in, tear the muscle itself, and let it heal. The problem with that is you get this line when you tear it and it's just jagged. That's not an issue, but the issue is if you think about it is if it's jagged in two or three areas, you actually have free floating muscle. So it doesn't have anything to pull and contract on. So sometimes when we dilated these people, they would end up with fecal incontinence. So we stopped doing that and we went to what's called a lateral sphincterotomy. If you read your operative note, it's called a left lateral sphincterotomy, really for two reasons. Once you put someone prone, which is face down, behind, up, that's the way we like to do the surgery. You have to stand on the left side of the patient. So from a technical standpoint, it's right there on the left, so you always do the left. 
So the first time someone has a sphincterotomy, it's called a left lateral sphincterotomy, and that's why it's done on the left side. You can do it on the right. Recurrence, we typically do on the right, but the first one is always on the left just from a positioning standpoint. In that situation, you don't have this ragged tear from the surgery. It's a straight linear tear, so you end up with a cut here and a cut here. You try to cut about 70% of the muscle so that it has this here form scar in this area and that scar achieves that dilated anus. Remember this is not just a thin muscle, it's almost like a can. You wanna cut 70% to 90% of the can leaving a little bit of muscle there to prevent fecal incontinence, but at least 70% so that they have a low recurrence rate. If this doesn't work and you do a right sphincterotomy the second time and they still have problems, then that's when you start getting into fancy stuff like an anal advancement flap. Basically what you're doing there is bringing mucosa up above the muscle once you do the procedure so that you're basically filling this area in with new mucosa. You fill that in, then that prevents this muscle from scarring back down and again, have to um, worry about a recurrence. But this is usually very rare. Patients that have this done for a anal fissure typically have something else underlying going on and it's not just that simple. As far as follow-up, same thing, pain management, cyst baths, um, increased fiber. These patients, they get in a fissure, I still give them the nifedipine 2% cream to help with their pain management afterwards. Pain medication will constipate you. So giving someone a lot of narcotics actually fights against their recovery. Again, same thing as always, urinary retention, UTIs, bleeding, UTIs in females, urinary retention in males. Um, we don't want fecal incontinence and we don't even have to worry about an anal stricture in these patients because they have a different problem. Fissure. That's pretty much it. Um, bright rib left rectum, fissure. Dark, hemorrhoid. Pressure, hemorrhoid. Razor blade, fissure. Next, what we'll talk about probably will be colon cancer because that pretty much hits the top three of issues that cause rectal bleeding in a general practice. Yes, there are inflammatory bowel disease. It could be Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, fissures, fistulas. Fistulas, anal fistulas are different than fissures. But for the most part, rectal bleeding, it's gonna be a fissure or hemorrhoid. Hopefully after these last two lectures, you kind of understand what we're dealing with and kind of help lead your doctor or help a patient understand what the difference is so we can figure out what the right treatment is for them. Thanks guys. Take care. Oh yeah. Instagram, DM me for questions, all that good stuff. All right. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with thunder with the rain. <laughs>